Good evening, everyone. All right, welcome to the March 10th school committee meeting. We are going to start off with our official public hearing, and then we will go into our regular meeting. So I will do the Pledge of Allegiance now before we formally get started. So can you rise? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. All right. So our first order of business will be to here have a public hearing on the FY21 school department budget. So I will hand it over to Mrs. Flynn and Dr. Bailey. All right. Thank you. Oh, there it is. I thought it was going to be on this one. Mr. Oliver, is that is it going to show up on here? Don't put it on. Oh, okay. Okay, so for the past three and a half months, our staff has been having ongoing conversations and dialogue regarding the budget. Um, I, along with Mrs. Flynn, the business manager, has spoken to the principals and all department heads, um, and the principals and department heads have spoken to people in their um, buildings or departments about what is needed in the budget. So none of this budget, I have to stress, is ever done in isolation. This is a team effort. Um, and everything that we're talking about tonight is aligned to our strategic plan. So when we talk about certain needs in the district, um, everything's aligned to the strategy that we discussed, we've been discussing all year. So the process, as I said, we um, ask all the stakeholders for their requests. And then the business manager and myself, we meet with all the administrators, including the principals and department heads, to review their requests based on the needs. And we ask questions, they tell us their thoughts, and then after that's finished, we then go to the budget subcommittee, and it's an opportunity for all of those administrators to present what their needs are to the budget subcommittee. So it's a very similar process. So right now, our preliminary budget for next year is uh, almost $15.5 million. Um, and that's an increase of over 800,000, a little over 800,000 over last year's budget. Um, for the first round, we're up 5.69% over FYI 20. Um, and what this budget discusses is it maintains level services. We are asking for three new full-time positions and one new part-time position, which we will discuss as we get further in the uh, presentation. So the components of the budget is just another way to look at it. You will see that the majority of the budget comprises of all the salaries. That takes up 57% of the budget. The tuition, um, that's 27%. And then um, student services is 8%. Instruction, 4%. Facilities, 3%. And administration, 1%. And this is very similar to how it looked last year. There is no big difference there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break about the budget components that Dr. Bailey just spoke of. Um, but before I do that, I just want to, you know, review what you have in front of you. You have a copy of the slides. You also have the budget. Um, it's a yellow piece of paper. You have the increases and decreases broken out with blue. Um, and you have the requested new positions as well as some of the capital requests that we're asking. That way you know what you're looking at. Okay, so um, the first component of the budget, the largest component, as one would expect, is um, our human resources. So it's salaries. So this is all of the salaries of the people that are employed by Cushion Public Schools. The next component is tuition, and this is approximately 27% of our budget for $4.1 million. And this is tuitions to high school, both um, special ed and regular ed, and also to our out-of-district placements, which are collaborative and private placements, so and any school choice tuitions. Um, so Bristol Aggie, um, New Bedford High, and Fairhaven High would be our high schools, and then also any school choice tuitions. The third largest component is student services, 
And in that part of the budget is the medical and health services, the nursing department, transportation, um, the school buses, of course, any uh, small amount for the intramural athletics and student activities, and also um, our residency uh, department. The next component is instructional services for just under 600,000. And we're gonna get into this in more detail as, as we go along, but this is just a big overview right now. Um, facilities is, makes up 3% for 455,000. And district administration makes up 1% 1 for 128,175. And that's the school committee, the superintendent, the business office, legal and advertising. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at each one of those components in more detail now. Mm -hmm. So salaries make up the largest component of the budget. For <coughs> FY21, all the salaries total $8,839,891. Now, we have a total staff of 142.25 FTE. So what that means is there are some people who might work 50%, some people work a 0 0.2 or a 0.8, but all told, it's 142.25 FTE. Now in the budget that we're talking about, our operating budget, we, we pay for 127.05 of those. And then the remainder, 15.2, come from any grants and funds. So we have a special edu education, IDEA grant, Title I, preschool revolving, and school lunch revolving. Yes, Mr. Can Spells. you explain what FTE stands for, please? Full-time equivalency. So <laughs> someone who works um, full-time, uh, say a teacher or um, an administrator, a uh, year-round custodian, they would have an FTE of one. Um, someone who works like a part-time secretary would have an FTE of sometimes 0.4, maybe 0.5. Um, the school lunch people have a smaller FTE because they work a lesser amount of hours. Okay, so Thank that's you. what that means. Yep. Okay, so, um, and that is comprised of, if we go through the salaries, uh, district leadership and administration and you can see how many is the FTE how many full-time equivalency make up that part of the budget and what the dollar amount assigned to it is so we go through district administration and leadership instructional leadership classroom teachers um, the bulk of course is our classroom <coughs> teachers they make up the bulk of our employees um, and again, from there, we have 2.5 paid by grants and funds, paid by a Title I grant and also a pre the preschool revolving fund, okay? Therapists, so that would be our speech therapists and our OTs. Substitute teachers, um, this, this expense is up slightly from last year. We'll go through that a little bit as we get on. Um, but these are, this is to pay our substitutes for teachers and paras, uh, paraprofessionals. Uh, six of them are paid by grants and funds, the 240 grant and the preschool revolving fund. We are budgeting for 5.0 um, guidance and adjustment counselors. One psychologist, there's a small stipend for our attendance and residency officer. Medical and health services is our nursing staff. In addition, our contracted um, salary with the school physician. Food service, we have 6.0 FTE, but you see zero coming through from the local operating budget. What that is, is that entire program is supported by the school lunch revolving fund. Um, but yeah, it's important to, when we have the total of, the, of our employees, to recognize them. Student activity stipends, these are stipends for any into after school clubs, um, athletics, anything like that. School security, this is our school resource officer and also um, an amount budgeted for any details that we might have to pay the police department, for example, for um, graduation, okay. Custodial and maintenance, there are seven employees, seven FTE. We have three custodians in each building for a total of six custodians, all full time, and one facilities director. Okay, so that rounds out salaries. Um, the second largest component is our tuitions to other schools of 4,169,213. So you can see here for FY21, we are budgeting for 10 students at Bristol County Agricultural, and that's the total tuition. It's a very small tuition because there is an assessment to the town from the county. So we just pay a small portion of it in our school department budget. 
New Bedford High School, we're anticipating 25 students, and that's the figure budgeted. Fairhaven High, 260 students, and School Choice, 18 students. Now, just a little bit of background on how we come up with the numbers of students and the amounts. So the numbers of students, we take however many students we have currently enrolled at the schools, New Bedford High and Fairhaven High, in grades 9 through 11, because we know they're going to move up next year. Then we also work with the guidance uh, staff here at Ford Middle School to see of all of our eighth graders where our eighth grade students are going. New Bedford High, Fairhaven High, Bristol Aggie, some may go to Bishop Stang, some may go to Old Colony. Old Colony isn't in the school department budget, it's in the town's budget, so that's why it's not, we're not discussing it. Um, but so here we can see, looking at next year's numbers, like I said, 25 at New Bedford High, and that's up quite a bit um, from the past few years, Fairhaven High. Um, is 260 and school choice is 18 students. Now school choice is usually a flat assessment from the state of 5,000 per student, but then some students may have a special education component to it or some other component that changes their fee a little bit. So right now, all told, we are budgeting for 313 students to be at these high school placements. And school choice, it could be elementary or middle as well. It's not just high school. Out of district tuition, this is our special education tuition. Collaborative tuitions um, are total 683,880 for next year. Private tuitions 214,342. Now that's offset by a circuit breaker revenue carryover. So what that is, is um, you know, you may have heard me discuss this in previous years, is it's a reimbursement for the state for costs in excess of the foundation that they will um, assess, you know, the, the number that they come up with. Anything above that, the state will reimburse for eligible special education costs, roughly between 70 and 75 percent. So, for example, if the foundation it hovers right around 45, if you have a special ed cost of 50,000 for a student, you would get reimbursed at 75% of 5,000. So that money comes to us um, after the special education department files a claim for it. It comes to us the following year and we can carry it over up one full year. And that's what allows us to know how much to put in the budget because this is, this is certain funds that the state has already said, this is what you're getting and we use it to offset what we need for, um, for tuition. You can see we didn't budget anything to use out of the special ed revolving fund because right now um, we don't anticipate needing to use it. However, as we go down the road in the budget process, if we need to balance the budget or get to a certain number and we, there's nothing else that we can really move around, we could tap into that special ed revolving fund. But that's, as you, as you know, a rainy day savings account that you try not to use, um, but it's there. Last year we had budgeted, I believe, 50,000, um, but this year, right now, we're not budgeting anything, okay? So you can see the graph here is just our out of district special education tuitions uh, for the past 10 years. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's, it's gone down, it's gone up a little bit, gone down, and it's pretty much holding, holding steady and it went down a little bit from last year. This is a figure that changes. It can change greatly um, based on the impact of move-ins, move-outs, a private placement. So this is just, you know, shows how much variation there is in this budget figure. And that brings us to our third largest component in the budget, which is student services. And we are at $1,304,695. And what that uh, consists of is attendance and residency, a small amount there for travel reimbursement for our, our residency officer. The medical health services, uh, that's our nursing office supplies. So that's $3,000 that's budgeted. Our athletics, student activities, and food service, $7,000. And this is really the budgeted amount that we put aside for contract services and supplies for our athletes for the athletic program. It could be referees, buses, um, any supplies that are needed, and then a small amount for food service. And then student transportation, um, which is almost $1.3 million. And then um, student transportation, we're going to break that down because that's uh, quite a large number, almost 1.3 million. The regular day bus, which is over just over $650,000, um, that's our big yellow buses. 
that um, arrive here each and every day. Special education, that's our out of district transportation, the placement transportation. Um, and as we've talked about in the past, we always try to cost share when we can. I believe right now we are cost sharing with Fairhaven. Um, so if we have a student who goes to the same placement, we split the cost of the bus. So we try to do that whenever possible. McKinney Vento, Vento, that is our homeless, that's for homeless students. Um, and we set aside $34,000 for that. Um, currently, I don't believe we have any this year, but that could change at any moment's notice. Same thing with foster students. Um, this year, I believe we had one foster transportation. Um, and in the past, though, we didn't track that, whereas we've been tracking on McKinney Vento. So just to go back to McKinney Vento, um, the last three years, we've been spending around 44,000, 12,000, and 30, oh, just over 35,000. So that's why that 34 is in there for McKinney Vento, just in case. Um, foster, uh, foster care last year, transportation, just below $16,000. So we've, we've put in $14,000. And then the late bus is our two days a week at Ford Middle School late bus. We have two buses. Um, and that's for the majority of the school year at Ford Middle. Okay, instructional services. That This is our fourth largest component in the budget. Um, $599,919. So the first line is school leadership when we break that down. And that is the expenses in the principal's accounts, the, the office supplies, this includes um, the elementary school, the middle school, the special education department, um, any dues and subscriptions for any of those departments. The next one is therapeutic services, which is uh, physical therapy, our applied behavioral analysis um, analyst position, but that, those are contracted services that include PT, OT, speech, and ABA. Professional development. Um, this is, again, for the district, AES, FMS, special education, any tuition reimbursements, PD consultants, conferences, any travel reimbursements, textbooks. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, instructional equipment. Um, that is if teachers or principals feel they need special equipment. I know we recently ordered kidney-shaped tables, risers for the music program, Last year we ordered um, science lab tables that were needed, student desks, things like that. Library books, supplies, and publications, that's a very small amount. Um, typically, any replacements for library books. Um, and we just felt like where we didn't have someone at this point on staff in the library, we would wait to get some direction if we can get a person, okay? Um, General classroom supplies, that's again for the whole district, and that is basically the glue sticks, the pencils, the crayons, the rulers, the, the notebooks um, in all departments. Instructional technology, that could be things like computer replacements, um, supplies, batteries, cords, things like that. Guidance supplies, um, again, a small amount for what they need um, in their office. And psychological services, that is uh, testing. We are now moving to an online component for psychological testing. We're going to talk more about that as the presentation goes on. But um, the reason why this is so high this year is because of the, the Wyatt testing startup for the online component that we want to do. Um, but our psychologist um, will be doing this in-house. So it's definitely worth it to do it in this way. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And one thing to add to the instructional technology, it also includes our internet access oh, yeah. and any of our contract services for any of our licenses for all the software, any outsourcing of any networking that mm. we need, um, any sometimes if we need to call in vertical, which oversees the phones, mm. things like that. So mm. that's included in that. So that's kind of a big number. So, but it's, um, you know, there's a lot of expenses to that, especially, you know, the internet access and then all the contracts. The phone, services the for phone all repairs. The, um, the next one, facilities maintenance. I'll let Mrs. Flynn take over from here. Okay, so this is our fifth largest component at 455187 
And in here, and again, these are all operating expenses. These are exclusive of salary. So these are all your operating expenses. Uh, custodial services, which would be supplies, custodial supplies um, and services, 51,000. Heating of buildings uh, to the oil for both buildings, 132,000. Utility services, which would be electricity, propane, water, um, and telephone. And also maintenance, that would be any of the maintenance supplies, any of the maintenance uh, services like the generator service, the fire sprinkler tests, the, um, the, uh, the fire um, extinguishers, anything like that that we have a specialized company come in to do any uh, preventative maintenance or check on that. So that's, that's what you see in that budget. Okay, hey, district administration, this is the smallest component at 128,175. The first, how that breaks down is the first section is school committee, and that's $12,000. This includes our MASC policies. As you remember, we signed on for three years um, to update all of our policies through MASC, so we pay for a portion of that for three years. Um, so we will now be in year two. Um, MASC dues for our school committee, uh, conferences for school committee members, that's what that line is. Superintendent's office, that's office supplies, conferences, travel, dues such as MASS, um, the NSIP program, the new superintendent's induction program. That again is a three year program at around $10,000 and next year we have it budgeted for $3,900. I'm sorry, that's for year three. Um, yeah, that will be next. I can't believe I've been here for three years next year. Wow, how did that happen? Um, okay, and then conferences, you know, the same type of thing. Um, curriculum and consulting, just um, almost $27,000, and that's we're using consulting services of Teachers 21. Right now, um, that agency is working with Ford Middle School on response to intervention. We also have utilized Dr. Roy. Um, she's done things like the curriculum audit, some training, some working with staff, consulting. Um, our business office, similar to the superintendent's office, office supplies, travel, conferences, registration, dues, um, such as MASBO. Um, the audit, that's required amount for our end of the year report. And legal, we kept that level funded. Um, so those are the fees for legal right now. So it's just over $56,000. Okay, so that's an overview of all of the major, of the entire school budget, um, broken down by components. The next part of the presentation is we're going to talk about how those have changed, like what has, what has changed from last year to this year, what makes up that 800 and almost $35,000 increase, because that sounds like a big number, it really does. Um, so we're going to break it down. You can follow along on the slides and also you can reference the sheet that has the blue highlights, okay? So the increase, um, and we're going to go through each component, salaries, tuition, transportation, facilities, professional development, supplies, utilities, and contracted services. So we'll go through all those. Okay, the budget adjustments. For salary increases, we are looking at uh, $483,986. Um, and obviously, this includes fixed costs such as the step increases and the salary increases per the contracts. So that's that first line. And then I'm going to talk about some new positions that the principals and department heads brought forth that we've been talking about that are aligned with our district strategy. So the first one is a library media specialist. And this proposed position is to be shared as you recall last year, um, a library para was eliminated um, with the plan of adding a certified librarian, uh, library and media, media specialist. And again, this is to help our students with 21st century skills, research, everything that this person would do would be aligned with the core uh, subject areas um, with our classrooms. And we have the space in both buildings, obviously, knowing that a lot of our supplies in the rooms are outdated, but until we get a person on, we would then look to that person's expertise and recommendations 
um, but we definitely want to add more of 21st century skills um, with that position. The second one is a reading specialist. This was requested by the Ford Middle School staff principal, um, and this is because right now we have a very strong structure put in place at the elementary school where we have interventionists, where um, students uh, who are challenged or struggling with reading, they have people there to service our children, and, and the infrastructure at the middle school is not set up for that at this time. Um, and the data is showing us that we have many children, many students at the middle school level who are not reading at grade level. And just to give you an idea, 37% of our fifth graders are reading below grade level. These are current statistics. 55% of our sixth graders are reading below grade level. Seventh grade, 72% of our students are reading below grade level. And eighth grade, 62% uh, of students are currently reading below grade level. When you get to middle school, they're really reading to learn. And if these students are struggling to read, to know how to read, we just feel strongly that a reading specialist is needed um, to work with those students who are still behind with their reading skills. The next one is a special education teacher, and that was put forth by our Director of Student Services. And that's always, these positions are always based on the number of students as well as the caseload of our teachers and at this time for next year based on the projections um, she feels that we need one additional special education teacher to be shared between the elementary and Ford Middle School. So again that one is very important as well because that's based on the students in front of us projected for next year. The next one is a part-time maintenance craftsman. Um, this this will be partially to offset, will be offset by the building rental fees. And just to let you know, in two weeks, we do have a scheduled meeting to discuss this further um, with, with all parties. The next one is school instructional leadership stipends. This um, is the school instructional leadership team that has been established at the Ford Middle School. And these are stipends for teachers who are working together to really lead the RTI, which is response to intervention efforts. And again, we have this structure at the elementary school. We do not have the structure at the middle school, so it's going to take us some time to get that into place. So these teachers will be working monthly with the principals as well as the Teachers 21 consultant. And then the director of cable and school department media um, that's a focus on the educational programming, training teaching staff, um, working with teachers and students to produce projects such as videos if they were working on something and they wanted to make a video. Um, and they would just serve as the operational director for the TV studio as well as the town cable operations. And this would be a shared um, cost with the town. So that rounds out all the salary increases. Again, um, it's just under 500000 and it's broken up into pretty much almost 50-50 between any step in contractual increases and any new positions that we're asking for. So the next largest increase is in tuition. Um, high school tuition increase was 249864 now, this is a factor of that number of students increased. We have more students that will be in grades 9 to 12 next year than we have this year. And there's also an increase in the tuitions to our high schools. Um, New Bedford's tuition went down slightly. Fairhaven High's tuition went up. So how we come about for the tuition fee is we have agreements with both schools that state you know, a number of items, one of which is what is charged for tuition. And they both run on the same um, formula that's based on the school choice uh, increment that's publicized by the state. So we take that increment, they assign a school choice figure, that's the baseline, and per the formulas that we've negotiated with each school, it's multiplied by 9% to, to factor in that it's now a high school tuition, the difference between a elementary secondary and a high school. And then in Fairhaven, it's multiplied, uh, it's a, a, multiplied by 1.03 percent as part of the agreement that we had in Fairhaven several years ago that stabilized the tuition so it's a declining you know 
increase, percent increase. So that's how that works. So this year, and so again, the tuition is first based on a baseline from the state. <coughs> Fair Havens went up, it's a calculation. New Bedford's went down. The, mul the bulk of our students are at Fair Haven, so part of this $250,000 increase is reflective of this 260 students times a, I think, just under $300 per student increase. So that adds up fast. And then we also have more students. And then that also includes any special education high school tuition. So some students receive special education services in their high school placements, and that might vary based on their needs. So some students receive a little bit extra. Some students, depending on their needs, receive more. So the average tuition is right around $10,000 for each school, um, but then the special education might go up to $20,000 depending on their needs. So that's how high school tuition works. We also have a decrease in school choice tuition. Um, again, we had three less students, and that's a factor of it's a $5,000 assessment from the state, and then there may be some additional costs based on any additional services that the student receives. We had a decrease in our out-of-district special education tuition. So the first part, we're going to take the second line down, is a collaborative tuition decrease. So the amount that um, Mrs. Betancourt is projecting for collaborative tuitions for next year decreased. And these are our students that go to placements in the um, SMEC programs, Reeds programs, South Coast programs. Okay, some of those programs take place in our building, some take place in other schools um, in the, around the county. There's also a private tuition increase, so we have um, some students attending private placements, so that increased. Um, and then you can see, I'll take the first part, which is the circuit breaker <coughs> revenue increase. So circuit breaker, as we mentioned, is reimbursement from the state, and it's based on your costs. So this year, we know that we're going to get $50,371 more in revenue from the state. So that's a good thing, but really it's based on the fact that our costs went up. So as our costs go up, our revenue goes up. But that offsets our total tuition in the budget. Um, and then we also, last year we had a $50,000 use of the special ed revolving fund. This year we're using zero, so that's part of the whole change from last year to this year. So all told, um, special education out of district tuition is decreasing by $57,583. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, there's no fluff in these numbers, correct? So for an example, if there's a student who's in school choice, but then transfers over to Fairhaven High in the middle of the year, we have the adjustment and then we have to come up with it out of our budget, correct? correct? correct. Or vice so, versa, so they've told guidance, mm -hmm. I'm interested in going to Old Colony, that number is assessed through the town, it's not in our budget, now they've decided they want to go to Fairhaven, and from putting four kids through the district, mm -hmm. I know how many of my kids' friends were like, oh, I'm going to this school, and then I'm like, wait, they ended up going to that school. Mm -hmm. that, that most certainly can and does happen, so, you know, and we, we work with the high schools to figure out, okay, you know, who is this student? Have they proven residency? Number one, when we get the roster from Fairhaven and New Bedford, I work with our residency officer to make sure that she has, that they all have proven residency. <coughs> um, and then number two, why are they on our enrollment if they're not coming out of eighth grade into ninth grade? Are they a move-in? Are they moving from Old Colony to Fairhaven? Um, and as you said, Mrs. Tavar, so if students that change from Old Colony to Fairhaven High, we would have budgeted zero for those students. Say they're in ninth grade right now. All of a sudden, over the summer, they decide, oh, I'm going to go to Fairhaven High. So now we've already set the budget. That's a $10,000 roundabout hit to us. Mm -hmm. Same thing for school choice. Not as bad because it's $5,000 that we would have budgeted for them. But now if they decide to go from, say, ORR um, or Dartmouth or um, Freetown Lakeville, Berkeley, that's where we have a lot of our students, all those schools there, prim uh, I think prim primarily Old Rochester. Mm -hmm. If they decide they're going to come back to... Um, to Fairhaven High or New Bedford High, then that's also a hit for us as well. So we budget for what we know now, um, but that can and does change. And for anyone who attends these presentations throughout the year, you know, that's one of the things that I'm constantly talking about is how that number fluctuates. Right, and so there's no padding of the budget right. with adding kids. We, it's just what we know at this point in time, and it could change next month. 
in the following month. Um, right, and that's a part that I've always felt was a little unfair to the school department because we're going to the town and we're fighting with the town for you know what we can get, and then we find out okay, you know, three students moved into town, or in the, and they're in eighth grade. I mean, we can't you know families move in all the time. They may have an eighth grader who moves who moves in over the summer, and then we have to find that money within the budget somewhere to pay for that student. And if that, you know, if a student changed from Old Colony, which would have been town assessed, and now it's going to be on the school department, again, we have to find that money in our budget. And especially if they're, you know, um, you know, spe you know, they have special, special, you know, special services that they need. So I will it's just say that the town hard. administrator has been very supportive and we keep constant communication on those types of situations. We, last year when we had several move-ins, I know that Mrs. Flynn and myself were constantly meeting with the town administrator about the situation and really just working together to get get us to where we needed to be with the budget. So that's what I anticipate would happen moving forward if that situation happens. Okay. But Mrs. Flynn does an excellent job of finding the money when she needs to. It's just it's always it's it's hard from a you know from a person who does my own budget. It would be really nice if we could afford to at least add two extra students, right. but I know we don't have the extra money to do that, but it right. just fiscally would seem appropriate, mm -hmm. but. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so our next uh, budget adjustment comes in student <laughs> transportation. So transportation changed, it increased by 101,382. So that's broken up by the regular day, which we call the big yellow bus, and that includes the late bus. So last year, if you recall, we had to take the late bus out of the budget to balance the budget. And so this year, we were able to add it back um, because of some anticipated savings in some special ed costs that we didn't know that we knew about pretty much in September and October when some placements had changed. Um, so we were able to bring the late bus back. And so we'd like to keep it for next year. So it's currently in the budget as it stands for um, two buses, two days a week. And the two buses, one covers the north part of the town and one covers the south part of the town. You know, you may see some and think those buses are somewhat <coughs> empty sometimes, but if they were to go on one bus, it would increase the, the time on the bus for the students. So we try to keep that as, as you know, short as possible, um, but that's something that we may have to look at, you know, in the coming weeks and months. But right now, the late bus is in the budget. Um, and then the, reg that, the other part of that increase for regular day is just simply the increase in our transportation contract. Uh, that's a fixed cost that we know will not change. Uh, special education, um, this has gone up, and this is based on our out-of-district routes that we have. Um, if a student attends an out-of-district district placement, we have to get them there. And sometimes um, these are all, these are always through, we don't own our own vehicle, so this is always through a contracted out with the small uh, van service. And sometimes where we can, we'll have uh, several students on the van if they're going to the same placement. Um, sometimes it's just not possible. And then again, as Dr. Bailey said, we try to share with other school districts where we can. I know right now, as she mentioned, we are sharing with Fairhaven. In the past, we've had cost shares with, um, at one time, uh, Dartmouth, Marion, I believe Somerset. Um, so we share where we can. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work out for timing or student needs, um, but we, we do our best because these routes are expensive. They are upwards of 200 to $250 per route per day. So over 180 days for one route, you can um, imagine how much that cost is. So that's, that's that portion of our budget. Okay, other budget adjustments. So um, the rest of it that comes up is just these ones here that you see. Facilities is increasing um, by 44,000. And these, again, um, this is operating expenses. So how we came up with this increase, it seems like kind of a lot, right? Um, but we took a look at what we're actually spending for um, equipment repair, parts, any facilities, custodial supplies, anything like that over the past three years. And we found that every year we're, we don't ever have enough budgeted because it's always the first thing that we 
have to cut when we have to cut our budget. So in this round of the budget, this is reflective of our actual expenditures over an average of the past three years. So we're trying to get it to where it should be. And so when you see some of these increases like that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the budget reflective of what we're actually spending. Um, sometimes it doesn't always pan out and we have to cut it to balance the budget when we get closer to town meeting. But this is our first draft, so we are increasing it to where it should be. Um, professional development, that is increasing. So these are conferences and seminars for the central office, for the elementary school, including um, administrators and teachers. Ford Middle School, same thing. Student services, this is dues and subscriptions for anything that, um, you know, that you would belong to. For example, for myself, the Mass Association of School Business Officials, the Mass uh, Association of Pupil Transport. So things like that are included. Um, travel reimbursement uh, and also any uh, person, uh, PD consultants, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, uh, Teachers 21, Dr. Roy, anybody that we might have come in to do professional development on one of our PD days. So that's what makes up that increase for the um, professional development. Supplies, um, that's just increases in any of our supplies that the um, principals, directors have asked for in the offices. So that could be anything from general classroom supplies to office supplies to nursing supplies. Any, any supplies other than, say, facilities um, would go there. Small increase in utilities, again, that one is based on what we've actually been expending. Um, I think I increased propane and uh, water because we noticed that we had been spending more in those over the, over the past three years. And finally, a decrease in contract services. And this is a result of the fact that we are going, we anticipate um, contracting out less for psychological services. We're able to do that in-house. So, um, so that decrease is reflective here. So that offsets the other increases. So that's you know, a summary of all of our budget adjustments. Mostly increases offset by you know, a decrease. And this is our entire budget by cost center. It's just another way to look at everything we've been talking about tonight. You'll see that the elementary school and Ford Middle School are pretty similar. They take up, you know, similar amount in the budget, 23% at the elementary school, 20% at Ford Middle School. Central administration consists of the superintendent's office, um, the business office, the school committee, that's 3%. The district, that's mostly technology, transportation, tuition, um, health services, our school resource officer, um, a residency officer, director of curriculum instruction and assessment, the teacher salaries, um, tuition re PD tuition reimbursements, guidance counselors, um, the guidance counselor position that's shared at uh, Fairhaven High School. So that takes up 28%, and the special education um, that is 26%, and that's the high school tuitions for the special ed component of the tuitions. Um, also, the private and collaborative tuitions, um, contracted services, trans special education transportation, paras, conferences for special education teachers, special education class supplies, our psychologists, the testing supplies. So anything that's in special education is in that portion of the budget. And this is just another way to look at it <coughs> by the numbers. So this summarizes how we got to our $15.4 million budget and the breakdown with central office, the elementary school, the middle school, and special education in the district. Okay, so this slide shows our budget from 2011 all through, all through 2021. The dollar figure and the amount that it increased or decreased in, in one year, you can see, and the percentage increase. So you can see it goes from, from 2010 to 2011, we had a 0% increase. 2012, it actually went down by 0.36%. Started to come up a tiny bit in 2013. 2014, we had a 2.38% increase. 2015, a 3.62% increase. 2016, 2.38. 17 was a very small increase of 0.72. 2018, 3.18. 2019, 2.49. 2020, 2.19. 2021, 2.19. 2022, 2.19. 2023, 2.19. 2024, 2.19. 2025, 2.19. 2026, 2.19. 2027, 2.19. 2028, 2.19. 2
2020, we had a 3.205%. And this year, the budget that we just discussed um, represents a 5.69% increase. So that's just kind of a history of where what our budget has done over the years. Just to clarify, that's not in 2018, 19, 20, all those years, that's not where we started. Mm -hmm. Correct. That right. was the, Correct. That's that was where we ended. landed. Mm -hmm. That's where so we landed. So now we're asking, so I remember last year, it was around 4.75, right. 4, 8 that we were requesting, and then we landed at that 3. We realize that 5.6% right now is where we're starting. Okay. You know, this is. For people to know this is what we need. This so. is the needs expressed by all of the stakeholders um, within the district, and we will push for what we can get, but we also understand that we have to work with the town mm -hmm. um, to come up with what we can come up with, what we can fiscally afford in the town. So this is our first go at it. We will be presenting this tomorrow um, evening at the joint meeting of the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, as well as the School Committee. But yeah, this is where we're at right now. So this is our wish list. It's not the final. Yeah. Right, like if, we, if money wasn't an issue in the town, this would be what we would want. And I do want to add that um, when we talked about the needs, there are many more needs. Right. And principals and department heads had many things on their list. But we really did sit down and prioritize what we believe are the um, priorities in the district. So this, this percentage could actually be much higher, but we're also being realistic. So we asked them, you know, what do you need to do to improve your school? So as Dr. Bailey said, you know, it could be much higher, but these are the things that, you know, somewhat realistically that we all came up mm -hmm. with. Um, and as she said, the list could go on and on. Okay, so a little bit about how the budget is funded. Um, chapter 70 is the state aid to schools. And every year, Kushner is scheduled, every school department, every city and town is scheduled to receive a certain amount from the state aid. And it's based on a very complicated formula. So Kushner is scheduled to receive $6,400,252 in FY21. And as in many, many years past, our increase is the minimum $30 per pupil increase. So the increase from last year to this year from the state is $38,760. So um, it's a little bit, but it's not, it's not a lot. And I just want to add that when we get into the budget tonight, we will be talking about the Student Opportunity Act plan. Mm -hmm. That coincides with this Chapter 70 aid. <clears throat> um, we have to now show the state how we are spending that additional $38,760 and have a three-year plan, which again, was not done in isolation. We met with department heads, um, and again, they know what their teachers are doing, so we think it's realistic for us to continue and it's not a lot of money that we're receiving compared to many of these other big districts that are getting millions of dollars extra. So I just wanted to let you know that you'll be hearing about that tonight as well. So for our $15,497,080 budget, 41.3% is funded by the state, by that $6.4 million that we just talked about. So what the town contribution, if, if this budget stands, would be 9,096,828, roughly 59% of the budget. Um, so this has varied over the years, um, but unfortunately, as in most school districts, the budget has grown more than state aid has. So now we're starting to see you know, a big divergence between the state aid and the town contribution. When I first started here, it was roughly 50-50. Um, but unfortunately, as you know, all educators know, the, the state aid, the foundation budget, just has not kept up with the actual cost to run a school district. Um, and so some schools have received more aid, but these are your bigger urban districts. So mm -hmm. in, according to the state <clears throat> formula, a Kushnet is already receiving from them what more than what they believe based on the formula we need to run our district. And it's just, you know, we're in the same boat as many other districts, and it just simply isn't adequate. Um, but that's, again, you know, how it breaks up. I think this is kind of important because 15500000 sounds like a lot of money for the town of a Kushnet. 
but there is some relief from the state. You know, not as much as we'd like, but we're not floating the whole cost either from that. So that's why we include that. Okay, the next section is capital requests. <coughs> and like last year, we are putting forth um, requests in the amount of $484,900. And this is separate from the Oh, separate million. from the budget. So this is separate and on top of. So we're asking for the $15 million budget, but then we're <coughs> also asking for some funds for all of these special projects. <coughs> Can I ask one quick question to go back to that last slide so that I'm not confusing to anyone? When we're at town meeting and someone will say um, your level service, your above level service funding, or there, there's always that so they, quote they that someone say will that say that we're above net school net spending. school spending, and okay. net school spending is what the state says <laughs> that's the dist a school the district minimum. has to um, expend in order to provide an adequate education. And that's, again, based on a formula that hasn't kept up with real economic indicators, such as the cost of, um, you know, and everything's included. Even though we don't pay for it in our budget, it's still attributed and comes into play health insurance for employees. So the, 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 uh, the money that's in the formula for health insurance hasn't kept up with actual health insurance costs, similar to some special education costs or costs for um, ELL students or other students. So um, sometimes that is said that, well, we're above net school spending, but again, net school spending is what the state says the minimum you need to spend, you have to spend because we report our budget, what we spent back out to the state after it's done, and if we're below net school spending, then we're in trouble. Um, so, but it's the minimum you must spend to have an adequate education, and I don't think anyone here um, agrees that adequate is what we're striving for. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So back to the capital request. This is roughly around the same amount that we requested last year. Um, we did meet with staff to prioritize um, our <coughs> list. Out of that entire list, we have four on here that are very high priority, being um, the curriculum, upgrade Wi-Fi in the district, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, replacing the gymnasium and cafeteria wall at Ford Middle School, and the preventative maintenance of the roof. Um, everything else is very important as well, and this list could have gone on and on, and we took some things off. For example, last year we talked about every year having a $25,000 capital improvement for technology. We decided to take that one off, knowing that we were asking for Chromebook carts at the elementary school. But it, it was just prioritizing the needs of the district. So curriculum goes along with our strategy. We are in the process of hiring a curriculum director, and um, all of our curriculum basically in the district is outdated. So we know as we um, adopt new curriculum programs, they're very expensive. They have a uh, software component to them usually, but we know that money will go quickly, so this is adding on to what we had applied for last year. So that's very important. Upgrading the Wi-Fi, and I'm going to skip around a little bit because I know uh, Mrs. Flynn wants to talk about some, some of hers. But upgrading the district Wi-Fi, uh, very, very important. It's really inappropriate for us to have students sitting on a floor in a hallway, and that has happened once or twice, to get a Wi-Fi signal. We need to have access to Wi-Fi in all of our classrooms, strong signals. This is what we use each and every day. That is a very high priority. Um, Chromebook carts, oh no, I don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about, um, I'll let Mrs. Flynn talk about the wall and then the roof and then we'll get into the other ones because I really want to highlight these four first before we talk about the other ones. Okay, so um, the next thing that we, we really have a high priority on is our roof preventative maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so as, you know, we've discussed over the past year or so, we are going to be replacing a portion of our elementary school roof, the oldest section, through the Mass School Building Authority. We're in the plan right now, um, so we are, but in the meantime, uh, leaks do pop up. We just had one 
over the past weekend so we need to address those leaks so we still need some money to address any leaks that pop up before we can get our roof replaced and also in any other areas of the newer sections of the roof so that's a continuing article from last year to this year uh, as is the curriculum you know some of these things we're going to just because they're so important and needed we're going to ask for every year and again last year when we asked for some of these funds the town was very supportive of our requests um, but sometimes it's everything is just not possible so you might see by the time this comes to the end to town meeting that these numbers may change a little bit um, so that's the roof preventative maintenance last year we also asked for some funds to replace the FMS wall between the cafeteria and the gym it's um, in bad shape it's a little dingy it's ripped uh, it's going on 20 years old it gets a lot of use and um, you know it's just more difficult for our staff to open and close it as needed so we had put in an article last year to replace this <coughs> unfortunately it's a if you've seen it it's a big large wall it's mechanical it's going to be electronically controlled it is a lot of money um, the quote we received last year was eight eighty thousand dollars so we've increased that slightly just in case the cost has gone up this year so that's one of our higher priorities as well mm -hmm. so I talked about the district Wi-Fi the Chromebook carts we're having a lot of success with using Chromebook carts um, at the middle school and many of our teachers would like them to utilize at the elementary school a lot of the instruction now uses technology so um, we're going to try for grades K through 3 understanding that that might be something that need, may need to be modified depending on how many we can get through. Uh, but we would start with the upper grades first. Okay, so last year we replaced the rooftop condensers at the elementary school that cool, that run our coolers and freezers for the cafeteria. So we would like to continue with that this year at Ford Middle School. They're approximately $10,000 um, each, and we are looking to do three at, the, at Ford Middle School this year. So that's the rooftop condensers. And again, um, you know, we find if we're not going to replace those, then the cost, the repairs that are needed that come throughout the year for that equipment goes up. So it's, you know, you either pay to repair it or you pay to um, replace it. Driveway repair. This is an ongoing article that we are looking for to continue to um, do any sealing and replacement of the of the roadways and the parking lots in the district. Um, we have some funds from last year that we hope this spring we're going to continue on with repaving the area behind um, Ford Middle School where the central office is as you come around the corner near the buses and go all the way up to where the sewer pump station is and then if there's anything left over we'll do some crack sealing and potholes and so we would continue on with that as much as we could next year for the driveway repair. Um, we would also are seeking to upgrade some of our security cameras some of our um, analog cameras to digital cameras so that's some funds in that for that um, we also are looking to install dark fiber from our buildings here on middle road all the way down to the police station in EMS so that'll help out with several town departments including the library the police and uh, fire and EMS departments uh, so that is something that we're looking to do uh, perhaps in collaboration with some town departments last year we replaced some tile in some classrooms at the elementary school i believe we did three classrooms um, and there's many more that can be done so we put in a small amount to replace tiles in classrooms there the tiles are starting to lift up um, so to continue on with that and maybe do some carpet replacements the carpets in the main office especially here at the middle school are in pretty bad shape so we put in some funds for that now you see thirty one thousand um, dollars coming off the top and those are funds that from previous articles from previous years that we haven't fully expended and we know we're not going to fully expend so for example two years ago we had put in an article for some restroom repairs at the elementary school for twenty thousand it turned out we didn't have to use that so that's just sitting there right now unfortunately it's so specific that we can't use it for anything but that but we're saying you know we're not going to use that so can we put it towards 
other things. And the other part that makes that up is we had asked for funds for the AES condensers, and when the quotes came in, they came in a lot less than we anticipated. So there's some money left over there. So we're hoping to, again, reappropriate that and put it towards some of our requests from this year. And finally, um, this will be the third year in a row, I believe, that we are funding or seeking to fund the Special Education Stabilization Fund. And I talked about a little bit earlier, but what that is is it's basically a savings account for unexpected special education costs. So say, for example, um, we don't budget for a student who moves into town that we are responsible for that now has a very costly private placement. Now what are we going to do? We don't, we can't, you know, put money together from the budget. It's just too much money. We have this fund that we would have to, that we could go to. It would require approval of the Board of Selectmen and the school committee to, to access, but it's there for unexpected costs. So it's a good practice to try to keep adding to that um, as we go along. So those are our, our capital requests. And again, those are separate and in addition to the local budget. So I believe um, that concludes our discussion of the budget. I don't know <coughs> if um, the committee members have any questions. We can certainly take them. I have just two really quick. Um, one, are we taking all of our, all of our state testing is done online now? Yeah, I believe so, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, regarding the roof maintenance, you had mentioned that we're still in the process mm -hmm. though, right? So we're not, it's not even though we're gonna do the, we need the maintenance money. Mm -hmm it's not 100% yet that we're going to be able to do the roof. So that will be above and beyond, like the capital request. That would be an actual correct. separate town so, article. Correct. So with the roof, we are in the what they call the pipeline for our project to be approved from the Mass School Building Authority. We have um, been in the process for a year now. And the next hurdle, the next step, is to get approval from the board, the Mass School Building Authority board, at an upcoming meeting. And prior to that, we need to have submit, submitted the schematic design package. And that right now is in the hands of the architect and the owner's project manager. We recently signed contracts with them through the town. So once they come up with all the required documents, they will submit it to the MSBA. And then we will be put on the next um, board meeting for approval for the project. Um, you know, I would anticipate approval. We've made it this far. Um, so as long as we have the town support and we have the documents in, I would think that we would be approved for reimbursement under this program. And under the program, you have two years to complete construction. So even if we don't do it this summer, if we are too, if we cannot get everything in by the summertime, then <laughs> including appropriation of funds, um, notwithstanding schematic design, appropriation, bidding, and all that, then we have next summer to complete it as well. So right now, I would say that it's more likely that construction on the roof will be done next summer and not this summer. So um, when do still... they need to know if, uh, if, if the town, because if the town doesn't vote to pass our portion of it, then it's a null and void, right? That we don't get the money from MSBA. Correct. They want we, a specific they, they want to know that, we're, that the town is supporting right. their right. portion of the project. So is that, does that have to be put onto this town meeting? It, it would be helpful if it does, if it could be. Will we make it right. in time? So that's what we need. We need the, um, we need a figure from the architect. Okay. So that's, so we need a cost estimate and how much this project is going to cost. And then we could put it on the town meeting warrant. We still have a little bit of time. But most likely um, But if not, then it would have to be appropriated at a separate meeting. Okay. So, okay. Um, or if the town would consider appropriating it in advance of MSBA approval. So we're working with the town administrator on that as well. Um, okay. What's the deadline for the articles? The deadline for the articles is, let's see, I don't have that here. Oh, I believe, oh no, uh, today. Um, but we, we've given uh, the articles that we have to the town administrator. We've discussed it with her. Okay. And I believe when Dr. Bailey um, spoke with her, they said that they would be coming up with the wording as they have in years past. Mm -hmm. So they're aware of what of all these requests that we're asking for, and we'll be discussing this um, tomorrow at the um, the joint meeting as well. 
If we potentially have a fall town meeting, like let's say they put that back on the books, and we do have the schematics and the amount mm -hmm. for the roof, then we could potentially go to town meeting in the fall mm -hmm. to get right. the money for the reimbursement. And that would be, I would prefer to either, if we can't do it this spring, to do it in the fall, because really if we did it this spring and got approved at town meeting on May 11th, to then turn around, go out to bid, select a vendor, do all the required advertising, the time that you have to have the bid out, the selection of the contractor, and have that ready to go by, what, June 15th would be the first day. It's a quick, quick turnaround for a large, complicated project. So but did you say that we have two years? Though? We do. We do. So if it doesn't work out for this summer, which it probably will not, mm -hmm. we if we can get it appropriated either this town meeting or next, or, or perhaps if there is a fall town meeting, that would give us plenty of time over the winter and early spring to do, to do the proper bidding and all of that. But let's say there's not a fall meeting, mm -hmm. and then we're waiting mm -hmm. for next spring. Correct. You would be in that same. We would be in that same. So I wonder if we're, I don't know where the discussions mm -hmm. will go with the town, mm -hmm. but if the discussions go with the town where it's like, well, we can put it on mm -hmm. this spring, but not do the project until the summer it would give you all year exactly. I guess my fear so is those, that we don't we don't have a fall meeting and now we're waiting so for next those spring are our, right, so those are our options would be this town meeting um, which is kind of a quick turnaround um, for okay. you know we really need for that the design, figure the money, for the that. design okay um, and then a fall town meeting would be I mean in for us, I believe it would be preferable. I don't know what's involved in that for the town, um, but for us, it would certainly be what we would prefer, or, you know, a, a spring town meeting, which is not preferable. So. I just remember being at town meeting mm -hmm. last year, and we were talking about leaks and buckets mm -hmm. and yep. disruptions to the kids. And I think, when you're not thinking about those issues, it's easy to forget that our roof is really right. The roof, that section of the roof shape. that we're repairing is, I believe, 40 years old. Right. Um, more than that, actually. Um, so it's original to the elementary school. And projects are funded by the state more than 20 years old for roofs. So the newer section, this roof here and next door, it's not quite there yet. Um, but certainly, we couldn't wait for the older section of the roof. So it's held up well for its age it's just really starting to show its age right okay. now well what was, thank you I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. what was the last conversation that we had with the architects and all that for um right now the they're just the last um correspondence i had with them was probably in the last week or two and they're just completing the the design the schematic design the design of the roof um no deadline for us I don't a have a, a date yet. Oh. Um, okay. What was unfortunate? They, I mean, they're coming next week actually to do another site visit. So we'll be with them next week um, during the day. And so, but what really unfortunately was a delay was getting those contracts signed and returned to the architect and the OPM. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, during this time, does anyone have any questions? If so, we will do our best to answer them if, uh, regarding the budget. Um, if not, if we can't answer them right away, then we can go ahead and ask Mrs. Flynn um, to get back to us with a response. But does anyone have any questions? If you come up to the, to the microphone. Hi there, good evening. Um, my question is, when the budget is pushed back from the town, how do you guys come together mm -hmm. to pick and choose what piece of the budget moves on and what piece, unfortunately, is left behind? That's a great Good question. question. Okay. So again, nothing is done in isolation. There's not one person sitting here who would make those decisions. Mm -hmm. They're done collaboratively. We meet with the department heads, the principals. Um, we talk about, it's really focused on the needs of our students as well as our district strategy. So th they're always tough decisions. Nobody wants to cut anything. But we try to prioritize, for example, if something we've put forth, if somebody feels that that's more important, that something else is already existing in the budget, they take that into consideration as well. So it's a lot of dialogue around these, these needs of our students. Can you go to the podium? Thank you. So we can hear you. Now, does the integrity of the salaries come first versus maybe um, you know, like the and Wi-Fi, uh, I understand is important, but do we prioritize the budget 
Um, so before, salary's yeah. a fixed cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sure do. Because, well, the, the right, added, right. like the, sure. the janitorial, I think it was, craftsman. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that would be dropped off before maybe, you know, a special ed teacher, correct? Like correct. that's something that Absolutely. goes. Correct. Right. So um, there are some costs that we have to keep in the budget. So no matter what, we know how much we have to pay for the bus for next year. Right. For any tuitions, mm -hmm. for... Uh, salary. So short of um, unfortunately cutting positions, there's nothing we can do in those areas for salaries and tuitions. But what we would do and what we typically do, in because every year we've had to cut the budget, right? Correct. We start out with what we'd love of to course. have mm -hmm. right, right, right. and then we have to, you know, adjust. Mm -hmm. So in typically what we would do, you know, you heard me reference, okay, we put some lines up to where they should be, a lot of supplies. So some of those, they're just going to get cut back to level funded. Right. So unfortunately, that makes up such a small, the discretionary funds mm -hmm. portion mm -hmm. of our budget that we really can't pick up a lot against, you know, any... Right area that we're trying to balance. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, we would look at perhaps any of the, the new programs, um, you know, for example, but one of the things that we talked about was the special ed teacher. Based on the classroom size and the numbers, right. that is something that is very important to add. So that yes. would, you know, that would be something that would maintain a higher priority. And again, as Dr. Bailey said, last year um, and in years past, like last year, I, th I believe we had to cut more than 300,000. Mm -hmm. So we met with the principals, the director of technology, the student services director to really look at, okay, what what must we keep what do we really want to keep versus what we can say you know what we'll try again next year and some of the things that you see year after year mm -hmm. like the reading specialist um, the library media specialist was a discussion last year as well those don't make the final cut but we try to bring them back to life the next year right. so right. so it's I, I hope that answers your yeah. question um, we try. It's a collaborative decision. Exactly. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Absolutely. And also yep. the budget subcommittee is involved mm -hmm. in all of these transactions. And, you know, as school committee members, myself and Mrs. Downing are part of that budget subcommittee. We always try to, you know, we always say, you know, whatever the students, students come first. Right. So that's pretty much how we, we cut things back, just like the other, the administration does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do our best with what we have, but it's great having the support here. And hopefully tomorrow at 7 o'clock we'll have support as well, you know, in front of the selectmen and the finance people to show that what we're asking for is truly important to our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hi. Um, Could you sorry. say who you are for the record? So sure. Ms. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Jonathan Tabs. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. This guy threw me off. He said, we need some buckets over in the elementary school. The oh, for the roof. <laughs> the um, is it so? Like the the increase here is I think nine point six percent. Like that, that's kind of an aggressive budget. So, so I would imagine. So the total increase, I believe, five. is five percent. Five percent. Five point six nine four percent. I think I was mm -hmm. all right. So the part mm -hmm. that we're asking for from the town, mm -hmm. though, right? Because there's a part, there's that part that comes from chapter the, 70, the chapter state, and then 90. like the the amount that you're asking for from the town, mm -hmm. I think is like probably a 9.6 percent increase, right? Well, the total is the 5.694, um, and then part of it is funded from the state, and part of it is funded from the town. So, okay. you know, I'm not sure, you know. I just didn't know how, how they'd feel break about it, down. it, right? Right, yeah. right. Um, again, this is what we are wishing for looking for um we hope that the budget stands but we know in in all reality and based on you know years past that it probably won't um and you're right uh that is a large increase when you saw the chart of our increases over the past many years it's one of the larger ones if it is the largest one mm -hmm. but as I believe um, mrs. Gomes said that every year it starts out at a higher a higher amount again last year we cut over 300,000 mm -hmm. from the budget um, so we would anticipate that if we have to get to say a two and a half or a three percent increase more in line with what we had then we would have to make some cuts okay 
Um, other thing is you get contract, uh, I think contract discussions open with probably a couple parties, Paris, custodians, right? Um, how, do you, how do you account for that in the budget? Because I would imagine that they would need to get um, some sort of increases, right? So we budget for what we anticipate, what we might anticipate having to pay. Um, but because negotiations are ongoing, yeah. we don't discuss it any further. <laughs> um, we'll be happy just, to. If you could just you imagine know, that, once. like trying to set a budget on something right. that could potentially happen. So you can see the whole schematics of doing all of this. So again, it's not a science. We do the best we can with, with what we have. Okay. So we know what our increase is for some of our units. Right. So that we can certainly, you know, attach that percentage to that. And then we make an assumption on other units. Okay. There were also positions that were open. was wondering if they were filled. The facilities manager, mm -hmm. is that filled? We're going to um, discuss that tonight during our personnel report. That's right. on we the do. agenda. It has been filled. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The curriculum coordinator hasn't, from what I heard. Final interviews are Friday. Interviews. Okay. Was there... And there was nothing in the budget to to account for curriculum if that position wasn't filled, for example, right? So the the position is funded in the budget. Okay. It was funded in this no, year's budget. No, no, I'm budget. saying oh. I'm saying as far as curriculum, right? So so whatever that duty is, right, hasn't been right. fulfilled. Like where where is that resource coming right. from? So some of that is offset by the consultants that Dr. Bailey talked about, Dr. Roy, who does some consulting for us, and also Teachers Twenty One. So we've had them both in the buildings this year. And so that's how we're funding them this year through that unexpended salary of the curriculum director. Um, oh, okay. But we hope that we will have the position filled. Right. Okay. And we also have everybody doing a little bit. Our principals, our department heads, we're constantly meeting to make sure that we don't leave things uncovered in terms of the curriculum okay. because it is a big need in the district. I'm not trying to take up too much time, right. too much time but I have a couple good. more questions. Um, the um, is it accurate to say that the technology positions in the town cover the school and the town? Is that accurate or not? They are shared positions. So, they predominantly so what, per cover what percentage the of that expense is put on the school budget? Just curious, do you know? It's approximately 80 percent okay. um, that's put on the school budget. Um, and in terms of, you know, that's how we've been able, the town and the school have been able to afford the services of these individuals. That's very important to, to both because, let's face it, I mean, everything in school runs on technology and everything in the town is now running on technology. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of times in some towns and cities, you will see some shared positions. It might be technology. It might be um, facilities. You know, it might be areas that maybe, you know, this came about because we couldn't fund a full um, department in our budget. And the town needed to fund some people, but they couldn't fund it either. So we came together and it, and it split. So although it's not perfectly ideal, it allows us to be able to run these departments um, pretty well, I would say. Okay, my, my last mm -hmm. question. Um, in, in the budget, there was a $6,000 probably stipend for residency mm -hmm. officers. I was yep. just curious um, the, the effectiveness of, of that position um, uh, as far as, you know, out of district mm -hmm. people attending accursionist schools or worse, um, adding to the tuition costs. Um, how are we managing that? So that's a, an important position. Um, and we do, we have one person who's doing all the residency checks. Um, how that works is a, if someone has an idea that there are uh, students here that don't live in a cushionet, there's a form that they need to fill out and funnel through the principal's office, and then it gets funneled through the central office, and the residency officer will do an investigation. How now, effective is that? Do you have a um, sense for that? Had, I don't have the exact no. numbers, but we've had several families or mm -hmm. students um, asked to go to their neighborhood districts mm -hmm. this year. I don't know the exact numbers. I'll try to get that for you now. Though. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we yeah. send, once we conclude the investigation, um, we determine that they are in fact not living in a cushionet. We send a letter home, we give them a final date that they can remain in a cushionet. Usually it's a week's time, but we let them know they have to register. And then our people call the neighboring school district to let them know that um, such and such family will be calling you to register. But we've had uh, a few this year. Um, 
that have gone back to neighborhood schools? You know, I recall, I don't recall the specific number, but I know last year I remember discussing at a school committee meeting when we were talking about high school tuition budget huh. um, during the course of the year that I believe I can check back, but there was about six students that were removed from our high school tuition rolls. So, so the based high on schools, that, I would say that's very effective. But the high schools are the residency, 000. is the residency being tested by the high schools? It sounded like you're kind of delegating that responsibility to them. Or? No, no. Okay. Um, so how that works is say we get a, a tip, for lack of a better word, that, you know, Susie Q is not living <clears throat> in a Kushnet. We find that she's not. She's dropped off process. at a bus stop. Right. We go through the process. Mm -hmm. And she has some older siblings that are attending Fairhaven or New Bedford High. It goes through the same process, and we contact the school. Um, in fact, you know, I can say right now at one of our high schools, there are several students who appeared on our roster that we do not have residency proven for that we have refused to pay for until those students prove residency. And I can say with certainty this year, there's three students right now. And we have removed students from high school placements um, in the past. So in terms of effectiveness, um, the high school students obviously are the most effective because they're costing us $10,000 a student. So when we were able to remove those students, you know, if it was around six, six students, that's $60,000 that the town is not paying. Right. So, um, you know, again, with a lot of things, we do the best we can with what we have. Um, so right now we are receiving tips. I know that sometimes staff may be frustrated because there are students that they believe that don't live in a cushionet, but we have to go through the due process and you know maintain everyone's rights, follow the guidelines, follow the law, and then even when we seek to remove students, they do end up coming back because there's some special circumstance that we've actually appealed all the way up to the Department of Ed or vice versa. They've appealed our determination and gotten it reversed. So I know it's frustrating. I know it's a hot topic, um, but it's, it's something that's not, that's very difficult that all school departments struggle with. I attended a, a, a meeting, uh, our, our annual meeting had a whole <laughs> session with attorneys talking about how difficult it is to indeed remove students. And even, you know, if there are students who have just a small portion of their house in a cushion it, but a larger portion in New Bedford, <laughs> it's very difficult to even remove those students. The Department of Education wants students in school, ultimately. But we also know it's on the backs of taxpayers, mm -hmm. so we do not ignore anything that comes to our attention, and we've done our due diligence with any tip that we've received. Um, and I know, Mr. Oliver, mm -hmm. you had some information to yes, share. Yes, I just heard from a residency uh, uh, person. Approximately 12 to 14 this year, four are on appeal uh, with the Department of Education, and three have moved back after further uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. um, I had one more comment, I'm sorry. Um, I, would, I was at um, some sort of parent discussion um, a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, and I would just suggest, like on the restroom repairs, I think there was a, a budget that was going back that was specifically allocated for restroom repairs. There were, there were people uh, saying that there, there, there were certain bathroom stalls that wouldn't lock, their kids would be like, oh, the right one always runs, like it never stops flushing. Um, so, oh, don't use that faucet. It, it squirts you in the face when you turn it on. Like, yep. So, so a couple of things on that. Okay. Um, the article for the restroom repairs that's going back, so to speak, that was to repair <clears throat> the pipes underground. Um, we we had thought based on some, you know, uh, investigation that we did that there was a hole in the pipe. It turned out um, when we put a camera down there, we jettied it out, it cleared it, so we didn't need that. So unfortunately, we've tried our best to try that. to repurpose re that. Exactly. Or, yeah, but we haven't yep. been able to. But then in terms of the, the sinks and the, the run or this or that, we have had a licensed plumber in over the past couple of non-school days, and he's repaired a lot of the, the sinks that when you push it, it squirts out out the, yeah. um, the top so right. they've um, replaced the stems in all of those and that that we know of um, and also any toilets that were running continuously 
So again, um, you know, when we have someone on board, um, they can be, they are able to do that if they are a licensed plumber. Right. Or we have to wait sometimes until there's a no school day to get into those bathrooms because it's, it's not as, unfortunately, it's not as easy as repairing your own bathroom when you can just kick out um, your would, brother or your sister. I just think know? we'd want working <laughs> yeah. bathrooms with all the yeah. hand washing so, we're I proposing. Know. I so know. one of the other Thank things you. that we talk to our principals about is making sure that in those emergency situations, they call right over. We know that we put the request through the school dude, the computer system, but for emergencies, we want to get notified right away so we can get those repairs done immediately. And I would think that a squirting sink would be one of those emergencies. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for asking questions. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, I am going to take a five minute recess before we go into our actual meeting. I need to use the restroom myself. <laughs> And um, so can I have a motion to go into recess? So moved. All right, second? Second. second. All right, I'm back in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> You've got your question answered about the of the tax. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Guys going to have you work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone, for those of you who have stayed. We will try to move this along as quickly as possible. So, my fault. I did not realize that we needed to make. Um, we needed to take a vote. Oh, excuse me. Oh, go ahead. We need to do a roll call to oh. go back in session. Okay. I'm sorry. Can I have a motion to return back into open to? Uh, well, we'll make a motion to return back into the budget hearing. Do you want me to? Finish mm -hmm. that one off. Yes. So I'm moved. Second. Second. All those in favor. We have to roll call. Uh, yep. And I was going to do roll call. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mrs. Gomes. Yes. Mr. Sumner. Yes. Mr. Zatara. Yes. Okay. And I'm a yes. <clears throat> All right. So we're back into public <clears throat> hearing, so we can make a vote on the 2021 school committee budget as proposed to move it forward. So it's not our actual certified bid budget, but it's to move it forward. Can I have a motion? Motion. A second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do I need a roll call on that? No. Okay. All right. So we will um, officially adjourn the public hearing session and open up the regular school committee meeting of March 10th, 2020. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, so we already did the Pledge of Allegiance. So approval of minutes, payroll, and warrants. Those were in front of us, and we've had an opportunity to review them. Mm -hmm. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 11th, 2020? Motion to approve. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the executive session of February 11th, 2020? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to approve the executive session minutes of February 14th, 2020. So moved. Second. Aye. All, Second. Those, in, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And lastly, a motion to approve the payroll and warrants. Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So at this portion of the meeting is when I would ask for delegation. If anyone would like to say anything, I do give anyone an opportunity to come up. I do limit it to about three minutes. Does anyone have anything that they would like to say tonight? No, okay. All right, there's no old business. All right, so new business is superintendent's report, Dr. Bailey, and you have a few matters under that. Okay, first one is personnel report, and you can refer to that report in your packet. We have, since our last meeting, we've hired four new staff <coughs> members. Um, two of them are long-term substitute kindergarten teachers. Um, one of them is a pre-K to two resource room teacher. And then we've also hired our facilities director and he is slated to start March 23rd. I don't know if Mrs. Flynn would like to discuss, but what we will do is when he starts, we will have him attend a school committee meeting. But the good news is he's a licensed plumber and he's got school experience, many years of school experience. I don't know if you want to add to that or 
that you know that about sums it up it's great that he has worked in a neighboring school department in the maintenance um, department for over 20 years and again he's their primary plumber um, and he is a licensed plumber and that's one thing that we know that um, here in the schools a lot of our repairs are plumbing repairs especially with all of our older fixtures we're just seeing more and more especially as mr. Tev stated the faucets that just squirt out because the stems have gone um, you know just different parts needing replacing so that will definitely uh, be a help to us and so we're excited to to have him come on board and as you mentioned we'll certainly have him come and uh, introduce him to the committee in due time. Um, we don't have any resignations or retirements we do have one termination of a teacher do you have any questions on the personnel report no okay the next one is an out-of-state field trip request, and I think this would be probably an appropriate time to talk about coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, I've been spending a lot of my time uh, really getting updates and guidance around the um, state of affairs in, in the state as well as the country and, and globally. But just to get the field trip itself out of the way, at, as of this date, um, we've only been advised that international trips should be canceled, and we really don't have that issue in a cushion it because we don't have a high school and we don't have any international trips planned. We, uh, the school committee did approve an out-of-state field trip to the Paw Sox recently, and this one before you is Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. Um, it's for June. What I would recommend at this time before I get into my update on coronavirus is approve the field trip at this date, knowing that we will see where we are at for both of those, and, and quite frankly, for all field trips at this point. So just in case the situation changes in the next couple of months, at least we will have it on record that it was approved. That's my recommendation. But I've already told the principals we will wait and see with all of our field trips. Mm -hmm. As they come up, we assess the situation. We are getting guidance, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So if we could um, you know, have the committee approve this with the understanding that it may be canceled, I would appreciate it. Does everyone have anything to say before we go to a vote on that? Okay. All right, I'm comfortable with that decision if everyone else is. So can I have a motion? to approve the out-of-state field trip request as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. So we have um, an evolving situation with coronavirus, as you know, and um, I get daily updates and guidance from a number of sources, um, the CDC, the Department of Public Health, the Department of <coughs> Elementary and Secondary Education, guidance from MASS, which is the Massachusetts Association for School Superintendents. We get updates from MASC, the Mass Association of School Committees. Um, I've spoken to our person in town, the Board of Health, and again, really trying to make decisions to keep our staff and students safe. Um, and every, all the decisions we do are in their best interest and for their well-being. So I first sent out a letter to all families, students, and staff on February 28th. Um, that basically, you probably saw that. That's actually in your packet tonight as some information that went out. Um, but we went over some good hygiene practices. Um, again, these are all things that are being shared um, with everybody. So the other thing is I met with our leadership team at that time that week sometime and we talked about at this point in time what are the things that we can do to be sure that our students are safe and healthy as, as possible so we thought it was really important to do an educational component at both schools so at the Ford Middle School we have our health teacher meeting with all classes about hand washing and the appropriate way to sneeze and cough into the elbow um, with the intent of disease prevention we are getting that information out to students also at the elementary school. Um, we've also purchased additional materials and supplies that are needed, such as masks, gloves for our health offices. Um, also, we're checking on our inventory of supplies for fever reduction or dehydration. Um, anything that our custodians need. So Mrs. Flynn has been in constant contact with our custodians, the head custodians, about what they need. We want to make sure that all the equipment is up and running. Um, and the last part of our planning is 
we wanted to make sure that our schools were being disinfected on a daily basis. So in addition to all of the daily cleaning and emptying the trash and wiping down the cafeteria tables and all those tasks that our custodians do, it's really important to us that they uh, disinfect all of the touch point, the main touch areas in our schools, such as door handles, keyboards, tables, student desks, in all main areas, toilets, faucets, faucets yeah. all those things that anybody can grab the handle. And this is done at night when there's no one in the building. Um, they've been trained on this, but we have equipment and chemicals that have been approved that disinfects um, disease, actually. So that, again, we're following all the recommended guidelines. And I cannot stress enough that we remain so committed to our students and our staff to make sure that we um, stay safe. Now today, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, just a quick question. Yeah. So now, since we don't have a maintenance person, is, are the principals responsible for making sure that things have been cleaned throughout the night, or who's? Yeah, so they would be responsible for their building anyway. Okay. So if they see, or they, this is so important that the right. principals and department heads should be checking the areas to make sure that those areas have been disinfected. Okay. Um, I know that Mrs. Flynn has met several times with the lead custodians to be sure that this is in fact happening in our schools every day. We also contacted the bus company um, because they have their own protocols in place and we felt like it was really important that, you know, they might do something monthly, let's say. We felt like it should be done daily because coronavirus lives on surfaces for, for days. So we are highly recommending to the bus company and we've been in touch with them about doing a daily disinfecting of those buses each and every day which would be the seats thank you yeah so today i, I did send out um, a letter to staff again with an update um, we are now considered in a state of emergency in the state of massachusetts um, and again i had a conference call with the commissioner of education as well as dph on last friday i have another one this thursday and we were just notified today that these will be weekly conference calls for all superintendents as we continue to deal with this evolving situation. But in addition to the things that I talked about, um, we are keeping a very close eye on all field trips. They may be canceled for obvious reasons because, you know, one of the recommendations at this point is they're recommending that people don't go into large crowds. As you probably, probably have heard that several events in the area have been canceled due to coronavirus um, outbreak. The other thing we're asking all of our staff, we're requiring them to share with us their travel plans immediately, um, effective immediately, so that we know where they're going, if they come back and they show signs and symptoms of coronavirus, which are just like flu symptoms, we have the right to have them be quarantined for 14 days so that it doesn't spread. While we have uh, the right to ask our, our staff to do this, we are also going to be asking our families this. A letter will go home tomorrow to our families, but I also understand it's more voluntary if they choose to share with us, but we're strongly recommending it so that we can keep all of the children and families in a cushion it safe and healthy. We're asking teachers at the end of each day to be sure that students clear off their desks. They don't leave supplies and materials on their desks or tabletops. Um, and that the areas be relatively free and clear so that when the custodians come in at night, because they are doing these extra things, we want to make sure that every desk gets sanitized. Um, so again, we'll have a, an updated letter to go home tomorrow for families. And um, Mrs. Benavides in my office will be in charge of gathering that information. I don't anticipate it will be many people at this point, but it's just nice to know that, um, you know, if people go out of the country and perhaps they come back and they could show signs several days later, it's, it's in the best interest of all of us, our staff and our students, to know this information so that we can act on it quickly. And if you've been following this, um, it changes by the day, by the hour. I know that the number of cases in Massachusetts has doubled. Um, we're concerned, but we're not panicking at this point in a cushion it. We are doing everything that has come through in terms of the guidelines. I do anticipate that they will tighten up the protocols for schools moving forward. 
I think that's going to come out from DPH, that moving forward because of what's going on in the state, that we will have stricter guidelines. But this is, as I know things, I've been communicating with our staff. Um, but we're committed to keeping everyone healthy and safe and to the best possible way that we can. If people have questions, they can certainly contact my office. But this meeting was already posted when we decided that it was important to do an update on coronavirus, but I figured it pertained because we were talking about an out-of-state field trip, and it also um, we listed that I had some information go out um, under number seven, communication and information. So I just want to let you know that I am dealing with coronavirus on a daily basis. Another conference call on Thursday, but the superintendents are sharing things constantly in the state uh, because everyone has a little bit of a different situation based on things that are going on in their districts. So at this point, we don't have anyone in our district who um, we've been told about, but we're keeping a close eye on things to keep everyone healthy and safe. Do you have any questions about that? No. No. Does anyone have any questions? No. 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 So thank you. Okay. You're welcome. The next thing is the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, we talked about this last month. And as we alluded to earlier in the budget presentation, the Chapter 70 uh, aid, we get $30 a, uh, per student, which comes out to a little more than $38,000, which is basically the same increase that we would normally get in a year's time. But now we are required um, by the state to put together a three-year plan. So if you look at the shorter form, it starts out with a cushion at public schools student opportunity plan, the 2021 through 2023. This outlines everything that we're saying we're going to continue doing. Now, because we're only getting $38,000, it's not realistic to think we can bring on extra staff and things like that. So these are things that in talking again with collaborating with the principals, department heads, we talked about things that we're already doing um, that align with our strategy. So one of the things we really have been focused on this past year and, and you know before that is math at the middle school level, which starts, quite frankly, the foundation starts at the elementary school. So we're um, utilizing um, Symphony Math, which is a program that basically um, allows students to have interventions and it adjusts the instruction based on where the students are at. So we wanna continue doing that. We've made a commitment through this plan and through our budget process to um, buy into this for the next three years because we're doing it anyway. Um, so you see that the budget under commitment number two is outlined. So for three years, unlimited access, which is a, a discount because you know, we basically said we don't wanna pay for each school. We want to be considered you know, a tiny district, a baby district, so give us the price for one school. So it's $16,900 for three years. So we're working on that. We also thought it was important to make sure that our students have enough Chromebooks in our math labs um, because those are used each and every day for this particular intervention software, Symphony Math. Um, if you go to commitment three on the second page, it talks about the metrics and how we are going to be sure that our students are making progress. And what we've noticed so far is that the teachers who are utilizing this with fidelity, the scores and the success rates are increased. So we will be looking at Symphony Math Benchmark Assessments, Galileo District Benchmark Assessments, as well as the student growth percentiles for MCAS um, to really see how we're doing over the next three years with this. But we're really trying to get everyone to utilize it with fidelity because this is part of the SOA plan that we must present to the Department of Second Elementary and Secondary Education. And the last section in this plan is engaging all families. So, you know, we're really focused on our high needs students, um, which includes students with disabilities and those who are economically disadvantaged. Um, we plan to do a math night. Um, a math and technology night so that we can have the person from Symphony Math come and show our families exactly what is Symphony Math, how can students utilize this at home, what does it look like, what are students doing with it. So to really inform our families um, about Symphony Math. 
Um, and then basically, um, we have to basically vote on this. The committee needs to vote on this tonight. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is this needs to be sent through to DESE as approved um, by April 1st. But if it gets approved tonight, I will send it through the portal tomorrow because it's, it's essentially done. Um, the date of the vote would be tonight and then the outcome, I'll just fill it in. So again, I can't stress this enough. This isn't anything really new that we're doing. This is a continuation of the work that has been started with just more of a, a greater focus on really, it's gonna hold us accountable to make sure that we're looking at this da data and making sure that our students are making progress. Thank Does anybody you. have any questions? Any questions? No. Can I have a vote to approve the Cushionet Student Opportunity Act plan as presented? Make a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. The next thing I have is the FYI 2021 district calendar. Um, this is not an easy <clears throat> task by any stretch to put a calendar together. Um, we consult with the town on the election days so that we want to be closed down on those days or, or at least be having professional development days so students aren't in session on those election days. We consult with um, our principals, our department heads, the teachers association to make sure that all of the dates are the best that we can do in terms of the open house dates, the parent teacher conferences, the professional development days. And we have a lot of conflicting things that we have to work around. So um, I want to give Mrs. Benavides credit because she really put a lot of time into this calendar. But the first thing you will notice is that the calendar looks different this year. Um, the calendar that we had before was fine, except that at least for me, I had to keep checking what was a P, what was orange, what was blue, what were all the codes. So what we tried to do different this year was month to month, put it right next to that month what each day off meant. Um, we have a key on the top. So the first day that staff report is highlighted around the box. The shaded days are no school days. Um, the days that um, our professional development days are highlighted and then any early release days you can see that there's a forward slash inside the box and then it's highlighted to show when it's a professional development day. So for example, November 25th, you see that's a slash with no highlight around because that's an early release for everybody for Thanksgiving versus October 8th, that's a professional development day. Um, it's an early release for students, but staff must remain for PD. One thing that is different on this calendar, and I know you've reviewed this, but I want to make sure that um, you understand some of the rationale. Usually in the past, we would, we would report, have teachers report the first day for orientation, and then our students would start the very next day. Well, the way this worked out this year is that very next day is actually an election day. So we're going to have the same first day orientation um, and then a PD day or vice versa, it doesn't matter, but we have two days in a row with teachers and then students will start. Um, we will do screening that week for our little ones and then the following week, our kindergarten and preschool will report on the 8th of September. So August and September, you, you see that's a combined month there on the calendar just to keep things um, easy to read. But I know that you've all had a chance to review this. I'm hoping that the new format is a little easier to understand. And then, you know, we've got the number of days in each month, and it just adds on because we, what we have to do is show 180 days. We are also required to build in five snow days into this calendar. So if you look on the month of June, we have uh, June 17th right now is an early release day, which would be the 180th last day of school if no days are lost due to cancellations. But we also have to show where would the 185th day be by building in those five days, and that would be the following week on June 24th, and there's a note there. Um, but again, if we don't have any cancellation, we go up to 180, which as of right now would be June 17th. There's some information on the bottom right. If, if the vote is taken tonight and approved, we will get this calendar right up on the website for families. We will get it out to staff, but we're ready. We believe this is a good copy after many um, iterations of, of the calendar. 
So does anybody have any questions about this calendar draft? No questions. I love the new format. Oh, mm -hmm. great. It's Looks much great. easier to read, I think. Thanks, Jen. Quick question. <laughs> is the oh, open houses... Sweat with that. Um, <laughs> I guess in the past I've had um, people come up to me to say that our open houses land on the same days as Fairhaven open houses. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that's going to be an issue again this year? I by do chance? not know. Okay. We can check on that. Yeah. Um, it's really I, hard obviously, within yeah, the district to get I'm our just dates. Wondering. No, yeah. I was just wondering if it was. Some of our PDs are aligned with Fairhaven mm -hmm. um, and some of them aren't just because we couldn't mm -hmm. do it and they have some different needs. Okay. But we can certainly just check that out. I'm just curious. Yeah. Can we find out? Not that I mean, I, would, I, I will tell you it, that but. the open house dates, we've gone through three meetings about open house dates and we've consulted with sure. the um, association, the teachers association. Those dates were very hard to book mm -hmm. because the elementary school and the middle school have very different needs. Um, and I, I think we learned something this year that we really want to be in the same room together when we plan this calendar because it was the elementary folks suggesting a date, the middle school suggesting, but then we had elections to consider and other things. So um, we have an idea for next year, but um, this is where we're at with it right now. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So without any other questions, can I have a motion to accept the or approve the 2020-2021 district calendar as presented? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Business manager's report, Mrs. Flynn. Okay. Um, you have the budget summary for fiscal 20, which um, shows where we're at with the budget. I know I did not include the, um, the school committee budget update, that one pager that says how we're doing. Um, right before uh, the meeting, the, 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 I turned in the materials to um, Mrs. Benavides. We had some changes in our New Bedford High School tuitions and also some of our out of district tuitions. So um, I need to update that. I didn't want to give you what was what I currently had without those important updates because it would just be already out of date information. And so that will follow. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that we, as you heard earlier, some of the New Bedford High School um, tuitions were removed from the invoice as a result of failure to prove residency. Um, so that's going to impact some of our anticipated um, amounts. And also, we do have some several, three actually new out of district placements. So that'll impact um, the other way. So as soon as I can uh, get that out to you, I will and will most certainly be discussing it at our next meeting as well. And the other component of my update this, this month is Alice training. Um, I know we've been updating you on what we've been doing with that throughout the past couple months. So at the professional development days last week, our staff re uh, received training from school resource officer Cathcart. Um, and they're now in the process of using the Alice Training Institute materials to develop the student lessons. And we will also be training custodians, cafeteria workers, and bus drivers at upcoming PD or um, other times that the bus drivers can can be informed about the Alice training. So it is ongoing, um, but we we are we keep we keep progressing with it. Just to clarify on that, it has not been rolled out to students yet. No, not yet. Nope, nope. Um, I'm not sure when the lesson are the lessons starting to go out to the students. Do so you that know, that will Sylvia? be in May. Okay. Um, with the thought that in June we would have a trial run, but. We have made a commitment to our families mm -hmm. that we will be completely transparent. For the, for the drill. For the Correct. drill. Yeah. But we will also be letting the families know when we start those lessons. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so there's newsletters that the principals are sending out and they're doing those updates with their weekly emails that go out. But we want to let families know right. that this is coming. Okay. Um, yeah, and it will be age appropriate um, done by the teachers. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we're almost done. We're going to do the superintendent's evaluation and then the last piece, which is that communication and information. Um, it was just things that were handed out to us. If anybody wants to bring anything up, we can, but I think we'll probably close the meeting with um, the superintendent's evaluation. So the way the superintendent's evaluation works is that each school committee <coughs> member is given um, the just the goals, Dr. Bailey's goals, any input that she's given us throughout the year regarding her goals and where she's been at. 
um, and where she is at with the goals. And, and that's happened. If you've been to our meetings, you've been hearing Dr. Bailey give us updates um, throughout her goals and, and where she's at. We also had an opportunity. So we, we had the goals in front of us. We had the state rubric. And each of us individually on our own um, read the rubric um, and, and scored Dr. Bailey where we each felt she fell. If we had any questions or we needed additional information about something we weren't clear on, we were able to go to Dr. Bailey and say, can you give us more information on where you are with this particular goal? So it was pretty simple. Um, Mrs. Benavides was able to calculate. We sent them directly to her. She calculated them all together, and we have our, our summary. So rather than say every comment that's on um, in each section, what I'm going to, what I, my thought was is I would just go over each step, I would say, like professional practice goal and whether or not it was met or not met, proficient, et cetera. And then I would say a couple of comments. And um, if anybody wants to elaborate or say anything different, you have everything in front of you. I just figured I wasn't going to read through every comment. This is all on. public record. It is all. That yep. People wanted to see the full comments. Absolutely. It's public record. Yep. We do it in an open public session meeting and it's a public, it's public record. All right, so the superintendent summoned of evaluation report for Dr. Paula Bailey. Step one was to assess the progress towards goals. So the professional practice goal, um, we, and this was consensus, so if, you know, if there was three and two or two and one, three and whatever, it came together. So it was met. Um, for comments, it says it appears that Dr. Bailey has done an outstanding job putting her learning and development to practice. It is clear that new procedures are being tried or explored to improve the district that weren't taking place prior to her tenure. Dr. Bailey continued to be extremely dedicated to the superintendent's induction program while giving in-depth updates on her training and the utilization of it within the district. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or is, nope, okay. So for the student learning goal, the rating was overall met. Um, Dr. Bailey has made significant progress towards her student learning goals in the midst of a challenging district culture. Um, the teacher's contract was recently ratified, oversight and execution of the contract, as well as a continued effort to create a positive culture and one district approach will be key to student success. Um, all right, so district improvement goal rating was met. Um, let's see. Step two, assess performance on standards. Standard one, instructional leadership was proficient. Um, let's see. The right plans are in place. We just need to get off the ground. We're moving in the right direction. I am pleased with our continuous progress. Standard two, management and operations, proficient. I think Dr. Bailey is doing an excellent job here. I have appreciated her commitment to accountability and transparency. Her vision for one district is key, and I hope we can continue to build on that momentum. Standard three, family and community engagement. Her rating was proficient. Um, we have made huge improvements in district-wide communication. Let's keep up consistency across all of our modes of communication. Um, communication is better. Standard four, professional culture, proficient. Culture is created by the efforts of many, not just one. Um, Dr. Bailey is doing a tremendous job of turning things around, and as a new leader in the district, this makes things even more challenging. We'll get there, and I'm appreciative of her vision, perseverance, and dedication to making a cushion at public schools the best it can be. Gone are the days of, well, we're just the cushion it, as Dr. Bailey. Bailey says, we are a cushion it. I am grateful of her leadership. Um, step three, overall summative performance. Summative performance rating is proficient. With that said, the district would not be moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we are moving in the right direction. Grateful for Dr. Bailey's vision and grit. Value her experience and skills that she has brought to our district. And I know we will achieve our goals onward. Okay. Anybody, I know I ended up just deciding to read through. Does anybody want to <laughs> say anything differently than what I read off or? No? May I just make a comment? Of course. Um, I think, you know, this reflects the work of many people of course. in the district. And many, many people are working hard in all areas, cafeteria, custodians, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, the central office leadership team, 
the support staff, everyone has a part in moving our district forward. And I've always said since I arrived in the district that we have to go slow to go fast. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we might have moved a little too fast and we had to reevaluate. And one example of that is the RTI at Ford Middle mm -hmm. School. So we took a step back and now we're doing things a little more thoughtfully um, and involving more people for it to be a collaborative process. Um, but this evaluation reflects the work of many and I have a great team behind me to do this wonderful work and I'm honored to work here in mm -hmm. a cushionette. Thank you. And you are correct from a school committee perspective as people may not know it's not always easy. We hire and fire the superintendent, we make policy and we go over budget. And as a school committee member, that's where our power starts and ends. Um, so if there's, so the only, pers the only person we really can evaluate is you mm -hmm. on our end of things. So um, I think for me in, in doing this, there were some parts that I was struggling with because I was like, well, do I think the district mm -hmm. as a whole ensures that? That's a tough word, ensures that. And um, I had to go back and read it, and it was true. It's what are we and what are you showing me that you're you're doing and you're um, you know showing the staff. It may not be that we may not all be there, but I have to say, okay, are you moving us in that direction? So I think for me, I just rem I just try to remind people when you're a school committee member, those are your those are your functions from the Mass Association of School Committees, and it's easy to say. Well, you do this and you do that, and no, those are our goals. So we can only evaluate where the district is going for you. Mm -hmm. You're the only one that we have a direct report with. And that's why it's, do you have an issue at the billing level? Contact the bill and principal, Dr. Bailey. Right. Don't necessarily call school committee because we have to. Well, I appreciate the ongoing collaboration and support from the committee members. I feel like we've worked together on policy, for example, um, and you know, I'm looking forward to the continuing in that manner. Thank so you. thank you, and I appreciate the transparency as always, so yeah, thank you. I think we've done a great job. Does anybody have anything else to say? No? All right. Well, I think we did a great job. So if we'll make um, a motion to approve Dr. Bailey's um, summative evaluation or accept mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. Bailey's summative evaluation report as presented. So moved. Second? Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Does anybody have anything else? No. Yeah. No, I don't have to go over uh. all those details, but I will add. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, so the um, Community Preservation Committee did meet today at 4 o'clock for our little toy article that I presented, and it was mo uh, voted forward uh, to the town meeting. So town meeting on May 11th, there'll be a vote for the $80,000 for the little toy project. So I am very happy with that. And I thank everybody that attended that meeting in support of us and including the, the CPC that voted it, voted it in for us. Um, and hopefully we will see a project very soon for our elementary school. Yeah. So we want to encourage attendance at town meeting. Yes, again. In support of that project, but also the, the capital uh, request that we talked about earlier. Yes. And the school budget and as right. a whole. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All Sorry. right. Can we have a motion to adjourn? Motion we to do adjourn. not need executive session. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Oh. Longest meeting of the year. Mm -hmm.